uh, because we had one one minute paper question from last time, which was more examples of do and with, which is fair enough. So uh, the good slash bad news is that you will have examples of this in coursework too. Uh, you might think that's bad because you asked about it, but I think it's good because you only really learn by doing it yourself, right? But I'm not going to be so mean as to only say that's the way. So we'll see more of it today as well. But I thought maybe we could uh, so remember last time we had this little expression language of expressions and then because our expressions included things like true plus seven when we were trying to evaluate expressions into agda values which was either a number or a bit uh, then we had to give our eval function this type so it takes an expression and it only maybe produces a value right? because it could be that it doesn't make sense to, to really produce a value from the expression. You can see that the value the crashes in this time by producing nothing. Yeah. And that's when we use the do notation to kind of thread these intermediate computations and only consider the happy path, right? So we're saying that if this doesn't crash and if this doesn't crash, then we're going to return this in the end, right? Yeah. So that's why we used uh, the do notation. And I thought maybe I could just do the if then else case in a slightly different way just to reinforce this. I'm going to comment that the old one. And I'm going to say we have the if then else case and it's equal to question mark. Right. Okay. So my expression is an if E B E T else E F. And all of these are expressions. So I have to evaluate them before I can really look at them. Um, and I can again look at this kind of happy path thing and say, so that's when I think I should use a do, right? That's when I, I just want to consider what happens along the happy path in this case, right? So I start with a do and then I put a question mark on the next line. So the thing that makes this a little bit tricky is that all of this block is going to be get d sugar to use as a bind, right? So you can't really put, it, it doesn't play very well with the interactive thing. If you try to say, do inside of the question mark, then, then that doesn't make much sense because it's not really an agda expression. So the way I usually do it is you put the do and then you always keep the question mark on the last line and you kind of add in other lines by hand here. So for example, if I first want to evaluate this EB, then I say I get a value B from, and then here if I want, I can put another question mark because the thing on the right of the bind arrow should be a real ugly expression, right? So I can still do that. And it's going to get yellow because Agda doesn't know what the type of this thing is. So it doesn't know what the type of this is. But then here in this hole, I can still play uh, with the usual way, right? So I can say, okay, let's evaluate EB. Okay, then I save and I reload. That should make the yellow go away. And if I now look in this goal, you can see. Um, okay, so we had some test cases down there, so we'll just comment these out as well. Well, sleeping being yellow. Oh, okay. okay. It's just annoying that you get constraints here. Um, Okay, so if I look in this goal, I say that now I still have to produce a maybe val, that was the type of the whole thing, right? But now I have a val VB in scope. And the way Connor did it before last time was he did a width on this thing. Uh, so what I can do instead, if I want this, I can pattern match here on the left in the do notation. So I can say, okay, well, I really is interest, I'm interested in the case where this is a bit of some B, right? So this is something you can do in Haskell as well, right? You can do this kind of pattern matching in the do block. Um, but Agda demands more of me because it certainly could be the case that this could be a bit B or some B, but then I haven't covered all the cases, right? So the thing here was a value and the value was either a bit or a number. So 
So here I've matched on the bit case. That's again my kind of happy path, but that gives me incomplete pattern matching. So I have to say where x goes to something. So this x here are all the other cases. So now again, I can pattern match on the x. Can I pattern match in this position? I'm not sure. No. The Emacs mode doesn't like this, but I can do it by hand and say, well, this could be a num n. And now I see I don't get any incomplete pattern matching errors anymore because I covered the bit case and I covered the num case. And then I should say what happens in the num case? Well, if the eb was a number, then, then we really lost, right? Because I said if seven. So then I think here I'm entitled to say nothing. This is what Connor said here, right? Yeah. So I get away with having one sad path. Yeah. But uh, it's kind of this, this funny sort of asymmetric pattern matching where you say, this is what I wanted, and this is how I deal with rubbish. Is uh, it's quite helpful because it stops, it keeps you on track, and stops the program kind of getting too wide. But I think, yes. Yeah, it's, it's quite nice. It would be nice if Haskell had this as well, but it doesn't. Right? So in Haskell, you would have to well, there's some kind of monad fail thing or something like this. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Uh, okay, so I think now Edwin did it first, didn't he? Yeah, probably. Yeah, this is yeah. stolen from Idris. So now, if we look here, we are on the happy path. We know that this became a bit, so we have a boolean b in scope, and then I can use the boolean. I could match on this again, but then I would have to have two cases here. So I think I'm going to use an if then else here, a proper if, right? That deals with booleans. So if b then something, else something. And then here I can say, well, if it was true, then I'm going to evaluate et. Otherwise, I'm going to evaluate ef. Uh, so I hope that's, I mean, it's quite a short example, but it's this idea that you use the denotation to only deal with, with the cases where everything returns just. And in the end, you have to actually produce something. And we look at the B in this case to decide which one of these we're going to produce. Right. Anything else we should say about this, Kamar? Yeah, I mean, just to say this is an example where in order to be able to keep our promise, we have to make a very weak promise. Uh, you know, we say, oh, you might get a value, and I'm not promising you whether the value is going to be a bit or a number, so you might have to put up with the wrong kind of value. And you know, up yours. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we should, for that reason, the test case is actually useful here, right? Yeah. So let's comment them back in. Uh -huh. And we'll see if we didn't break anything with this refactoring, so that's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then you would have to say where num goes to something. You could, I think you could have yeah. a layout here. Yes, so where is a layout, Harold? You can write multiple cases. If you do that, you will you should get a grayed out. That can't actually happen. But yeah, if it was if there were more possibilities, yeah. So what, what you often so here yeah. it, it I didn't it didn't help me to know that the, the wrong thing was a number, right? So probably what I really want to write here is where anything else. Yeah. There's only one happy path, which is when it is a bit. And anything else, I'm, I'm just have to accept defeat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how it works. So here, this is manual. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, it's one of these situations where, in the ecosystem of experimental programming languages, uh, the people who have hacked up the programming language feature are some years ahead of the people who are figuring out how to make the Emacs mode help you. 
So that's what happens. So you use new features that the user interface hasn't caught up yet. Uh, but you're quite right, there should be something. You should be allowed to yes. use pattern match on the X here, right? I get all the yeah. cases. But, but unfortunately, the MS mode is not there yet. Yeah. Um, yes, crucially. So uh, like, like do, where is a layout herald? What that means is that uh, the symbol that comes after where, in this case, the underscore, uh, is, a, is a thing that stuff can align with. So you can write multiple. So stuff indented the same as that belongs as, as different branches of the where clause. It's a, again, taken from Haskell. It's unbelievably complicated. Implementing layout is miserable. OK, so that was all of the questions from last time. Um, so let's continue. So the teaser we left you with last time was that it was kind of annoying to have this weak promise of saying that maybe we get a value, right? Um, and we remember that you could either try to be, well, so this is as good as it gets, this is being honest in the output, but we could try to tighten up the input so that we don't have to be so disappointing, right? Yes. And the idea we had for doing this was to actually keep track of the object type of the language, right? So, so now it gets a bit confusing because we have the Agda types, but we also have the types of our small expression language itself. Um, yeah, Hutton types. So the Hutton types, and they are very simple here, right? In, in honor of Graham. Um, so we either have numbers or bits. We have no function types, we have no product types, we have no nothing, right? Yeah. Everything is either a number or a bit because we want to focus on just this idea of adding types to the language and see what happens. So I declare these as a new data type. Um, of course, it's a two constructed data type, so I could just have used the booleans, but, but that would be really stupid because that would be really confusing, right? I'd rather say num when I mean num rather than true, and I'd rather say bit when I say mean bit rather than false. Um, and then I'm indexing all of the types with, sorry, all of the expressions with a number. Uh, so these are my type expressions, right? And we had this discussion a while ago about indexes versus parameters. And here it's important that it's an index because I want to have different types for different expressions, right? Whereas if it was a parameter, then everything would have to have the same type which would rather defeat the purpose of having types to start with. Uh, so it's an index, so it's to the right of the colon. And I'm saying that numbers, well, if you give me a literal number, then you get a typed expression of type num. If you give me a literal Boolean, then I get a type expression of type bit. And plus demands that the two arguments are numbers, but it also produces a number then, right, as you would expect. Uh, and if then else finally says that, well, for any type t, if we have a bit expression and then two expressions of the same type, then we get an expression of that type t. Right? So here we have another kind of constraint where we're saying, well, this has to be actually the same. It's be a coincidence that the type of this has to be the same as the type of that. Um, so that's, that's just the data type expression. And uh, of course, all the meaning is in my head still, right? I mean, this might and might not make sense, but if I change this bit to num, then of course, Agda is going to accept this. It's just the data type so far. Right? But what would happen is that the eval function I would write would, might not work with, with this, right? So there's, there's still a lot of design going on, and there's still a process of turning my idea of what these things should mean into what, what Agda thinks they are, right? But okay, let's see if we can now write an evaluator for these typed expressions. And I want to ha it to have this more precise type. So I want it to work with typed expression of any hat on type T, so for any T in Thai. Um, and I can now be more precise about what my output here is going to be, right? So before we said it's a value which was either a number or a bit, but depending on this T, 
I should be able to decide if this is really a number or a bit, right? So I can write this type level function, which takes a Hutton type and gives me an Agda type for it. What's with the gratuitous Greek? Uh, right, I think. <laughs> make it a T. Um, right, so this is turning Hutton types into Agda types. So this is like an evaluation for types, right? And then following that, we have an evaluation for terms, for expressions. Uh, and there's nothing magic about this. I just pattern match on T because it was a data type. I have two cases. Well, it's either a number or a bit. And I want to turn object numbers into Agda numbers, natural numbers, and object bits into Agda booleans, right? Again, this is me making a choice, but I had something in mind when I designed these types, right? I wanted them to turn into these things. Uh, okay, so then we can write this evaluator. Um, I think you wrote the last one, so maybe I write this one. Sure. Okay, uh, so what do we have? Well, we have a type T, which is going to be inferable from the expression, so I've made it implicit. We have an expression, and surely we have to pattern match an expression to know what it means, right? So I'm going to do that. Okay, and then do the renaming. Right. And it's, it's joyous. You notice these sub goals are, have more specific types. You know, when we see, when we learn a bit more about what the expression is, we also learn a bit more about what type we have to deliver. That's, that's really cool. So I'm going to call and these expressions E's rather than T's. Because then I can say E true here rather than TT. Okay, so we, I just got given these are all the possible values of the expression. That looks exactly the same as before, right? If I look here on the left. But as Connor says, if I look at the types of these goals down here, when it's a number, then I have to make a T val num. When it's a bit, I have to make a T val bit, and so on, right? So I can go into the goal, fully normalize it. I see that the X I have, which I'm going to obsessively rename to an N, the N I have, is a natural number, and I had to produce a t vol of num, which is now computed to a natural number. So I can just return the n. And similarly for the bit, I have a boolean b, and my t vol of bit has turned into a bool. So yeah. I can just return the b. So if I got it wrong before, then I would be in trouble here, right? And I would hopefully realize that I made a mistake. It's, it's not an accident that the Agda types which represent the values are the same Agda types we use to embed constants into the expression language. Yeah. You know. Because we, you, would, <laughs> you would get in trouble here if they weren't, right? Yeah, we did that deliberately. Okay, so then we can look at the plus case. So because I gave the kind of syntactic plus the type num to num to num, I see that my two sub-expressions here, E and E prime, really are expressions of type num, right? Which means that if I recursively evaluate E, uh, then I really get a natural number out, right? And the same thing if I evaluate E prime, I really get a natural number out. So I can take E, I can add that to the result of evaluating E prime, and that's going to give me a natural number overall. So I don't have to consider the case where this could go wrong and produce a bit for me, because I know that this has object type num. So this becomes much more straightforward. It's just turning into recursive calls and then plus at the end. And similarly here, I know that my E B is has is an expression of type bit. So if I recursively evaluate it, uh, EB, uh, then I really get a Boolean. So I can say, if that Boolean is true, then something else, something. And here I have to produce a T vol T. So I get that if I do an evaluation of ET, 
and the same here. If. So that again turned into something a bit simpler. Right? There's no need for the do notation anymore because we are computing. Because there's no sad part. We're not managing failure. We're excluding failure. Um, what you could still get wrong, though, is I could still mess up the order of these. Oh, yeah. So there's, this, um, there's still a choice. Um, it's, uh, it's a thing that, that you ought to be suspicious about when you see a programming language with an if-then-else construct and you see that the then branch and the else branch have the same type, despite the fact that when you've tested the condition, you know more than you used to. You know, what's different after we learn the thing? Apparently nothing according to the type system. How, how does that make the slightest bit of sense? It's so often the case there are many programming languages which have an if-then-else construct where it is a valid type-preserving transformation to swap the then branch and the else branch of every conditional in, in a lump of code. And, you know, this is guaranteed to preserve type safety and go wrong. <laughs> That's the key thing about dependent types, is that the type system learns when the program tests stuff. It actually reflects back the point of finding stuff out to justify what happens next. So speaking of what yes. happens next, um, <laughs> why don't you see, Connor, if you can find any kind of relationship between these two languages we have considered? So we hmm. had an untyped one and we had a typed one. Right. right. Can I use your keyboard? Right, OK. So uh, we're, what we're going to do, because, right, it's all very well to have uh, this kind of excluding garbage out by not getting, not allowing any garbage in. But, you know, people write, people write programs, uh, you know, sooner or later, somebody has to, somebody has to check that a program that has come in from the wild is okay, right? How do we, how do we get our hands on these well-typed terms that are definitely going to give us values? Uh, they come, they, when they come from the wild, uh, we, haven't, we haven't checked them out yet. So we're going to explore that process. And, uh, and what we're going to do is uh, to uh, write a type checker. But it's, we're going to write a type checker that tells the truth. So in order to specify that type checker, we're going to need this function. We're not, this it seems, might seem kind of a weird retrograde step to say, can we turn a typed expression into an untyped expression? Um, uh, but uh, we're, going to, we're going to be using this function backwards as part of a specification. You'll see how that goes in a moment. But straightforwardly, um, we've got, we just have to do the recursive thing, which throws away the fact that we know this function's well typed, or this expression's well typed. So I guess I'll, I'll do the, the, the alpha conversion rename all the things. Oh. No. I really like to take screenshots on my keyboard. I do. Um, fingers do the wrong things. So yeah, this looks, I hope, like an obfuscated identity function. Uh, except the types are different. Right? Except, so yes. Uh, all we're doing is, so these are 
On the left, we've got the constructors of the typed expressions. On the right, we've got the constructors of the untyped expressions, which we deliberately made look the same. So these pipes, Connor, uh -huh. are not allowed to just be ASCII pipes because that's what you're using the word. Oh. Right? They so, are backslash pipes. Oof. At least that's the same key. But yes, isn't it marvelous uh, that you can use any old Unicode you like? Uh, and, you know, people do use non standard Unicode spaces, non standard Unicode colons. It's really, you know, people just stick random vegetables in iPod programs. I mean, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, um, that's, uh, that's we've written a forgetful function which throws away stuff we knew. Um, so uh, what happens uh, next, this is a slightly amusing choice, um, where we are interested in saying, well, Venturing an opinion about uh, an untyped expression. When is it well typed? It's well typed if we can think of a type and an expression of that type. And that's almost good. I mean, because. Uh, uh, you know, it would be you know, kind of funny if somebody said, like, could you please type check my program? And the machine responded, certainly. Three is well typed. Whether or not your program happened to be three. Right? <laughs> you don't just want to know whether there is a well typed program. You want to know whether your program <laughs> is well typed. So that's what we use this forgetful map for. What we're saying is, we, victory looks like hooking up the typed version of your program, not any other damn program. And there's a, we're, we're playing, we're, we're being cute about the happy pass here, saying we want good, the, well-specified thing. Failure, we're not managing particularly effectively, but uh, it's really interesting to write down the type of a program that has a leftmost type error. That's mm. a good move. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. So, let's see how we go. Okay, we're, we're trying to infer whether our program is well typed or not, better look at the program. Um, so, uh, what happens? Uh, we, uh, we've got a number. Is that well typed? I think it probably is. So we can say just something and we've got to give back one of these records uh, and I think I say okay refine then it asks for a type I'm going to change this x to an n because we've been doing that and I'm going to give back 
here uh, the term num n, and then I'm going to ask Agda to solve constraints. Oh, yes, and I'm going to ask that to be filled in automatically. So, yeah, we've, we've, we've got one example done nicely. Okay, so what happens next? Um, uh, uh, same deal. But actually, yeah. Um, so. Okay. So we've done the two constants. How about plus? I'm guessing this is where the early part of the lecture where Fred taught me how to use fancy do notation things was important. <laughs> so let me see if I've learned my lesson. Um, well, first of all, because we still got here, we're still in the situation where things can go wrong, right? Someone's given us potentially dodgy program, so there is an unhappy path. We do have to manage failure, uh, so we're using the monadic structure maybe for that. And moreover, it is possible that we get the wrong type. Our untyped expression could be a bit, not a number, so we might not be able to add things, and we've got to reject the bad stuff. So we can say, I hope we write down the happy path. Will it let me do this? Let's find out. Um, I guess I'd better choose different names for the type things. I guess I can shadow. I like shadowing. Can I just go the whole hog on this one? You can try. Right, and it's complaining about incomplete pattern matching, and of course it is. But, uh, right, so this E is the sanitized version of this E. I have deliberately chosen to use the same name to push the bad one out of scope. That's such a me thing to do. <laughs> I don't even want to be able to talk about the rubbish one any longer. Right. <laughs> so I deliberately push it out of scope. Okay, and then we've got a where anything else is a problem. Like that. Um, okay, and then we can play the same game with E prime. And now, I feel lucky. Okay, I don't feel lucky. <laughs> Let's just see whether Agda can figure this out. Right. So you observe that because the problem is so tightly specified, because the well-typed term we have to give back has to be the well-typed version of the thing that came in, there ain't no choice. If you want to be happy. Right? If you want to be happy. So, yeah. I'll take that, thanks. So, yeah. And there's maybe one more thing to comment on. So, yeah. you pattern matched as much as you could up here. Right? Yeah. So, it's maybe instructive to change these refs into P and Q, say, and see what happens. We don't pattern match on these.
<laughs> then uh, it no longer type checks. The, the equation is no longer obvious. I'll stick a question mark in there. And now it's, it's slightly confusing that we shall be an E prime. Right? Sure. In that there'll be some shenanigans here because I've pushed some expressions out of scope. Yeah. <laughs> so in order to formulate the problem, it has to make up new names for things. Uh, but it's saying, hey, we know this equation, we know that equation, we want this equation. Uh, but uh, so by, by pattern matching on REFL here, you get that equation for the rest of the do block, right? which is really cool. Yes, so that's the whole point, actually, is that we still have these variables that have funny names that stand for the un untyped versions. Uh, when I pattern match on REFL, um, Agda's actually substituting the forgetful image of the good thing for the bad thing. So if I... Maybe I'll do one. one of them. Exactly, yeah. And then you'll see. So you can see that the one I went pattern matched on Refl for has actually been substituted. Still have the Q in scope, right? But if I pattern match on that as well. And so here we had E double prime. And when we now reload, it has turned into the erasure of E prime, right? That thing matches on the nose. It's always good. This one advantage of co-teaching is uh, when your co-teacher notices you pulled a fast one and makes you do it slowly. <laughs> um, what's what's the magic, or rather, what's the how do, how do we make it exact? Something that that looks a bit magical. How do we show it's not magic? That's kind of the point. Now, oof, that's terrible. Now, I suspect I'm having a bit of a trouble here. I'm trying to figure out what happens next. Yeah, um, something interesting. This, yeah, something a bit tricky might, might show up. Well, there's some stuff we can do, right? We're, um, we're in half reasonable shape, maybe. Um, so, um, what happens? Uh, I'm going to play the same game. Um, right. And it tells me that's incomplete. Okay. So I've just done the same move. I wanted a bit. So I said, yeah, you're giving me a bit, uh, and I'm substituting the well-typed version for the untyped version. So far, so good. OK, but now I've got to worry about the um, uh, then branch and the else branch. And I have to be a bit, a bit less fussy about which type I get. But I need to be a little bit careful, too. So I'll say, OK, T, E, T, REFL comes from infer E, T. And notice this time I don't get shouted at for a, a catch-all. Uh, because I'm not fussy. This, if, if, if this thing gives us a just, it gives us something which this pattern will match. Because I'm not being specific about what's here or what's here. So the only yes. pattern matching we're doing here is, well, okay, we're saying it's an okay, but There's no every, choice every record starts with an okay, right? Yeah. Um, and we're pattern matching on the raffle, but there's only one case, which is the raffle case, right? So there are no, there's no incomplete pattern. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, now I'm going to play the same game here. So far, so good. But it's nice to know that the then branch and the else branch are well typed. But uh, what else do we need? Well, we, we could try and 
give back a result now and see what happens. We could. Let's ask Agda what what's what are our options here. So far, it can't find anything. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe it's stupid. Maybe we are clear. <laughs> we know better. Right? Yeah, we, this. Okay. Just just at all. Just okay. We know what the expression is, right? Right. We want it to be if if e if e e b then e t else e f. Yeah, we checked that the two branches have types. We haven't yet checked that they're the same type. So I guess we'd better do that. So you could think that you could just change the F to a T, right? True, we could do that. Oh, no, no, sorry, I meant in the pat when you, <laughs> you infer the type of EF, yes. you got the type F back. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, I, I've just I've written something that type checks, and it does go in the hole. I get a big pile of yellow, and then I get a request to prove an equation that just isn't true. So no getting out of it that way. <laughs> but yes, Fred was suggesting that I just cheekily do that, and I know what that does. That even looks like it might be all right. <laughs> Except what happened was that this T just pushed that T out of scope. They're not the same T. Pattern matching, checking things are the same by using the same name twice isn't a thing in this language. It is a thing in some languages, but not this one. You might think it works, but it doesn't. Yes. So we have to come up with something. We actually else. have to do a non-trivial amount of work to check that these two types match. So let's give ourselves a thing that does that. What should we call it? EQ type? Eek tie. Yeah. Huh? Why not? <laughs> Sorry, that was a standard joke amongst computer scientists. Ooh, how do I type this Unicode Backslash thing? Backslash equals equals. So this is a carefully, oh, it's going to be like that, is it? Make that into a hole again. I can make you whole again. Um, right. So this, we're actually saying we're going to have to do some work. Going to look at these types. Going to check they're the same. And if they're the same, we're going to give back a proof they're the same. Uh, you know, we could do something more elaborate if we wanted to bookkeep when they're different, why they're different. But this will at least get us over the line. Yeah, so the, the natural type for this would be to say they are either the same or they are not the same, right? But, but uh, in this case, because we are going to go into a maybe thing anyway. Yeah, so I'm doing a maybe thing because I then will be able to use it in a do block. Yeah. Okay, so just raffle. Just raffle on the diagonal cases, but off the diagonal. Well, actually, ha, 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 ha. It doesn't really show up when there's only two constructors. But uh, when you play this game with lots of constructors, if you've got n constructors, then you've got n diagonal cases. And you've got order of n squared off diagonal cases. So you really, really want that catch-all. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now we're in a position, I hope, 
to say, Raffle comes back from testing eektai query tf. And now if we look at the whole, uh, things are looking up. <laughs> so, uh, I've done another screenshot. One more screenshot, okay. It's because... Uh, Right. I don't even know how to make take screenshots. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now we're in a glorious position. The equation's trivial, and the type is eminently guessable on solving constraints. Um, so uh, it uh, looks like a good place to stop. Yep. So. Right. But yeah, there you go. There's a pipe checker written in a style where uh, we, uh, uh, we first of all specify it by writing a forgetful operation that says we can forget that good things are good. And that's used not ever in real life. We don't ever run that program. We use it to specify the program that we do run, which is basically showing that we can work our forgetful map backwards. We can find the typed program that forgets to the untyped program. That's to say, we can find the typed version of the program we started with. And when we do that, when we got that type of specification, you saw actually, let me just see what happens. Uh, if I say just question mark, and then it immediately just gets it, because there's nothing else. There's nothing else to be done. So um, it's one of these things, uh, it's a strange lesson about the honesty of types. Uh, it, is you know that uh, the people people who moan about the type systems of 20th century programming languages complain that the type checker won't let their program work um, because their type system isn't rich enough to even tell them what the program is. And whereas here, when we write types down that have precise specification information in them, sometimes when we're lucky, we get paid back for having said what we wanted. You know, it isn't, I mean, it looks like cheating, but actually we paid for that lump of program inference by saying what it was we wanted. 